Welcome back to One Hit Wonderland, where we take a look at bands and artists who are known for only one song. And today we finally, finally, finish off the requests that I sold off on Patreon. Thank God. <laughs> uh, I, I will do it again next time I'm absolutely desperate for cash, so probably soon. I accidentally sold way too many, though, so next time it's going to be, like, stupid expensive. <laughs> Jeez. Requests, requests. Well, anyway, on to the episode. And, you know, it seems like I do a lot of 80s new wave bands on this show, so after all that, it's finally time to end on something a little different. An 80s alternative band! And those are absolutely not the same thing. Out where the river broke. Billboard started the alternative rock charts in 1988, as it became not just an underground thing, but a force in its own right, with R.E.M., 10,000 Maniacs, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers all becoming big deals. But one of the biggest hits of that genre that year actually came from our good friends Down Under, a nice intersection between the rise of college rock and the weird Australian craze of the 80s. Yes, the band we are talking about is Midnight Oil, named after the nightly application of baby oil that keeps the lead singer's head so shiny. These Aussie rockers, led by what looks like a hulked out John Malkovich, were big in their native country, but in the US they only notched one top 40 hit. One of those wacky 80s novelty hits about that most hilarious subject, horrible human rights abuses. <laughs> what a goofy decade, am I right? Ah, uh, yeah. I would love more than anything to avoid heavy topics right now, but just fair warning, this is gonna be a fairly dense episode. I didn't pick it. Don't blame me. Blame the Australian government. There's blood on your hands, Sir Robert Menzies! Okay, before the hit, they were Midnight Oil, founded in 1978 in Sydney, Australia. And they released 11 albums. No joke, this band has the most extensive and substantial discography I've ever covered on this show since Chumbawamba. Once again, you guys have handed me an actual, legit band. What am I going to do with you guys? I was taken downtown for the part in the demonstration. I hear they are right when they started out in the late 70s. I have to say, I think a big part of the appeal is Peter Garrett, the giant mutant who was the front man. This guy, he, uh, kinda looks like Michael Stipe on steroids. Kinda dances like Michael Stipe on steroids, too. It's a, it's a striking image for a band, you gotta admit. Now they toiled in the underground for a while, they really started hitting big around 1982, and by big, I mean Australia big. Like, there's a whole music scene down there that we know absolutely nothing about. I mean, my image of Australian music has been largely formed by, well, this. But that's the cartoon version of Australia. There's a lot more going on down there. Like, you know how Australia is so isolated and weird that its environment brought us such oddities as the platypus and the echidna and the drop bear? Well, that's a lot like what's going on down there musically. There's a lot of stuff down under that just doesn't make it up over. But why Midnight Oil specifically? Why did it take them so long to cross over? After all, they were writing about such a universal topic. Australian politics. Yeah, they were very, very earnestly political. They strike me as kind of an Australian U2. And that comparison will probably be helpful in describing why Midnight Oil was strictly regional for a long time. Now let's take a look at one of U2's angriest songs, New Year's Day. All is quiet on New Year's Day. You know, the holiday that's supposed to give us a clean slate and start fresh. Nothing changes on New Year's Day. Now that punches right through the bullshit, right? Very direct. Now let's compare that to one of Midnight Oil's hits that similarly takes down the hypocrisy of Armistice Day. Y'all watching people fighting, y'all watching people losing, 
on Armistice Day. You know, Armistice Day. Look, I don't know what prompted them to write this. But I do know that Armistice Day is really important in Australian history because it celebrates the end of World War I. And World War I is a huge turning point for Australia because they lost hundreds of thousands of men in history's all-time stupidest war for no reason other than the King England told them to. And that's basically when Australia started to realize that this whole being an appendage of the British Empire thing, this this whole relationship, it's it, it's not working out. Looking for a war, and the only guns I saw, never used in anger. So I guess that's why Midnight Oil decided to write about it. You know, it's saying about this day when we remember the fallen soldiers, you know, the bullshit. Most of you never saw any fighting. It's all hollow. Of course, that's a lot of context I had to add for one song here. I mean, you didn't know any of that. I had to look it up. It's, it's all fairly Australian, is my point. Most of us don't know that much about Australia. Name me an Australian Prime Minister. Can you? I can't. Master Blaster? This song is especially for those people who are sitting on the Gold Coast or the Sunshine Coast or the Cannabis Coast or the Cane Coast or the Watch It Disappear Daintree Coast or whatever and are a little concerned about the disappearance of natural things. I have no idea what you're talking about, dude. The song they're introducing has nothing to do with the environment, by the way. Another thing that may have limited their appeal, they may have been just too edgy. U.S. forces give a nod. It's a setback for your country. Certainly, I don't think Americans in the Reagan era were ready for this. The market for left-wing protest songs in the early 80s was not that big. Anyway, by the mid-80s, they were really coming into their own, becoming big damn deals in Australia, and they were trying to reach into America and the UK, but it, it just wasn't happening yet. Also around this time, get this, Garrett ran for the Australian Senate. <laughs> Didn't win, obviously, I mean. What kind of backwards-ass country lets its celebrities with no political experience get elected to office? Am I right? This one's for Henry Kissinger, who got the Nobel Peace Prize for bombing the living daylights out of Cambodia. Oh my god, it never ends with these guys. The Zulu and the Navajo The Belgians in the Congo shot I think even Rage Against the Machine would be like, God damn, don't you guys ever talk about anything else? Can't we just watch a football game or something? Why does everything have to be so heavy all the time? But anyway, I think we finally made it to 1987, when they released the album that would break them overseas, Diesel and Dust. And according to this book, see this? Diesel and Dust is the greatest Australian album of all time. Seriously, Back in Black is number two. Kick by NXS is at number 11. Air supply doesn't even show up at all! And of course by this point, being political is starting to get cool again in America. Born in the USA and the Joshua Tree are huge hits, so the time is right for the Oils and their new album, which would bring them their biggest hit of all time, The Dead Heart. We carry in our hearts the true country, and that cannot be stolen. Biggest hit in Australia, I should say. It actually crept onto the Hot 100, too. It's about the plight of Aborigines. Coincidentally, that was also the major theme of their second single, which was... I, I love this intro. Hold on. Okay, that is totally the Peter Gunn thing. Or, close enough. Out where the river broke The blood would the Desert Oak! Desert Oak! <laughs> Garrett's scene on this one is like halfway between Johnny Rotten and the guy from the B 52s. Okay, anyway, about the beds. Why are they burning? Is this like about that Farrah Fawcett movie where she burns her abusive husband alive? No, no, no. It's actually, it's actually much uglier than that. Okay, you know how in America we have this thing where we tend to screw over black people and screw over the natives? Okay, well, in Australia, the black people are the natives, so they were able to screw them over much more efficiently than we did. And by the 80s, there was a big push towards reparations or something. The time has come to save I, I, 
think that was pretty common knowledge in the 80s. Even a total backwater hick like Crocodile Dundee was supportive of some kind of compensation. Aborigines, well, like all God's creatures, they just want the right to roam across the earth and be left in peace. But while the history of Aboriginal people getting boned is pretty extensive, Beds Are Burning is about a specific part of that shameful history, and <laughs> get ready, because it's pretty bad. Yeah, the Australian government needed to test some missiles, but the site they wanted to use had a bad infestation of... people. So, you know, just blowing them all up, that would have been too evil, but doing the test somewhere else wasn't nearly evil enough, so they just rounded everybody up and shipped them away and compensated them with a nice fat check for zero dollars, and then they put them in these badly made cheapo government camps. Oh, and they also stole children from their parents, like, uh, forever. So it was a really bad deal. So the chorus, I'm not sure exactly what that metaphor means, but it might not be a metaphor at all. I think, you know, beds might literally be burning with, you know, the missiles. Yeah, how can you dance when all these bad things are happening? Okay, well... I mean, you're dancing. You're, you're dancing right there to this song. I, whatever. But you can see why they were upset, right? Beds Are Burning is the ultimate song of white guilt. Like, not every left-wing song about injustice is meant to make you feel bad. But this one is. It's about, you know, us, we, what we did wrong and what we need to do. But of course, it's, you know, it's bouncy and it's upbeat and that makes it go down easier, I guess. Plus, the solution they propose seems, it seems so easy. I mean, let's give it back. I mean, let's give it back. Give them back the land. It's that simple. Of course, no, it is not. It's almost 30 years later and that fight's still happening. Midnight Oil performed at the 2000 Olympics in Sydney and... You can see they're wearing those shirts because, at that point, they were just trying to get the natives an official apology. They did eventually get that, by the way, and some of the natives just moved back onto their old lands anyway, government be damned. So yeah, that's a big deal, but again, it's all very specific to Australia. I'm not sure how many people knew any of that stuff. I think they just like the groove. You gotta admit, it's pretty tight. Look, when I started this show, I had this solid idea for the structure based on what I thought was the career path of the one-hit wonder, and more and more I'm finding it not useful. Failed follow-up. Muse has never had a pop hit. No one goes, man, those Muse guys are huge failures. This is a stupid structure. Stupid. Stupid. I, I need to revamp this show entirely. Christ. I suck. Anyway, Midnight Oil never made the top 40 again, but they were seen pretty often on the alternative rock charts. In fact, their biggest rock hit might actually be the first song from their follow-up album. It's called Blue Sky Mine. But if I work all day on the blue sky mine, there'll be food on the table tonight. See, there was this, uh, this asbestos mine, and the mining company was a little lax with the safety standards, and, um... Didn't go so well for the miners. <laughs> Gosh, researching this band has taught me so much about all the awful things in Australia's history. <laughs> Good ambassadors, you guys. I'm starting to wonder if the Mad Max universe is an improvement. Yeah, like I said, this was number one, as was its follow up. The hardest years, the darkest years, the roaring years, the fallen years. This is my favorite of their songs, actually. The reason you've never heard of any of these songs is that. Pretty much the entire pre-Nirvana alt-rock scene has been erased from history. Unless you were one of the really huge bands like R.E.M. or The Cure, it's like you never existed. World Party or the Hoodoo Gurus, they were doing really well. And then Kurt Cobain had a mosh pit at a pep rally and it all went away. Anyway, that's what killed them over here. And they were still doing decently well in Australia through the 90s, but... You know, they'd been going for a long time. Eventually, the hits dried up. Well, the band broke up in 2002, because Garrett wanted to keep pursuing that career in politics. And get this, he did it! He got elected to Parliament. 
and then he was appointed Minister of Environment Protection, Heritage, and the Arts. Which is a weird combo of responsibilities. And later he was Minister of Education. So yeah, here's an instance where music did verifiably make a difference. So, who knows? Maybe someday we'll end up with Senator Eddie Vedder or something. Can't be any stupider than what we have now. Anyway, he's left the government and they've all reunited and Garrett has released a solo album, so uh, you can check all this out on your own time. Usually when I cover these bands who are huge in their home country, I say, you know, they did so well that they didn't need to do better, but here I'm saying, yes, they deserved way better. Now this was a good damn band with a serious legacy and they're absolutely worth your time. So, do you like political music? Are you into 80s college rock? Are you okay with some of the topics being a little obscure to your little northern hemispheric mind? Well, check these guys out right away. <laughs>